As of yet, the PlayStation 5 has been pretty underwhelming. That's right, I said it, I said it. There have been a couple of somewhat interesting titles that have come out at this point, but nothing that really makes the console a must buy, at least in my opinion. I mean, of course, all of that's gonna change the second that Abandon comes out, because let's be real, that's gonna be a console seller if I've ever seen one. Now, this is mostly because of the lack of true exclusives that take advantage of the hardware. Most of the major releases to this point have been cross-generational, meaning that they cannot truly take advantage of the new hardware. Some games like Returnal or Demon's Souls certainly take advantage of the improved hardware with faster load times and the like, but nothing has really felt like it could have only been on the PlayStation 5 yet. We see little pieces of what the system can do in each of these titles. In Demon's Souls, you see the graphic fidelity increased significantly. In Returnal, you see the benefit of the SSD allowing you to quickly reload every time you die, which is useful because most people are gonna die uh, probably six, 7,000 times over the course of a run of that game. So the improved load times are greatly appreciated, at least for me. Now, let me be clear, this is very expected. Most new console generations start off a little bit staggered and stilted. Usually it takes some time before we actually see really impressive games taking full advantage of the hardware come forward. And the PS5 is no exception, but Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was intended to be the ultimate answer to that issue. It was supposed to bring haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, ray tracing, and crazy fast load times using the SSD all in one package. Truly a game that would completely take advantage of everything that the PS5 had to offer. And boy, does it not disappoint. The incredible load times, data transfer speeds are all truly next generational. And in addition, the ray tracing just adds that much more realism and fidelity to every single frame. Sure, the ray tracing isn't as noticeable as perhaps the fast load times, but it adds to virtually every single shot. Clank's metallic body reflects environmental light realistically, Rivet's helmet reflects the light from what's in front of her, and puddles and glass present much more realistic and grounded looks than they ever could have before this. The game also features different modes for performance, performance with ray tracing, and a fidelity mode, so you can have your pick. You really can have your cake and eat it too. There really is no other way to put it. Rift Apart truly is a next generation experience graphically in terms of the gameplay and what we actually have here as a product there's a lot of issues you see unfortunately the game feels very rushed and very incomplete you see the game is glitchy and while very well realized graphically it's very unstable at least as of the time of this recording i had two hard crashes of the game and the console during the course of my runs furthermore i had a handful of soft locks which is where the game reaches a point where you can't progress any further usually without reloading to a previous save or restarting the game entirely and there were lots of issues with pop-in and graphical glitches with regards to assets loading in. In this shot, you can see a robot clipping through a door. In this case, I had an enemy glitch into the top of the arena, so I couldn't actually get to him. This is an instance where you have to reload in order to progress. It's very frustrating and something you would not expect to see in a AAA major release that's meant to showcase how fantastic new hardware is. Or this case, where the world just didn't load at all. <laughs> or in this case, during a boss fight where the game respawned me into lava, which soft locked me. So every time I loaded in, I would instantly die. It would pop me back right where I was before in the middle of the lava, and it would just cycle and cycle and cycle. To get past this, I had to go to the home screen, close the app, and restart from a checkpoint. Or in this case, where I ran into a really bizarre loading warp glitch, where I never loaded out of the warp screen, so I ended up just drifting into infinity and beyond. I let this thing go for like 15 minutes. He just kept spinning and spinning and spinning and going. And at the very end, I even flipped the camera around and you can see how the warp level screen, whatever scene was built up with all the different planes of textures and everything. It was kind of cool. It was like getting behind the scenes looks at how they make these levels, but it's not supposed to happen. And this actually locked up the console to the point where I had to fully restart my PlayStation 5. Only I couldn't just do a quick restart of the PlayStation 5 because when you would press the PlayStation button on the center of the controller, it would pull up the menu, 
but you couldn't navigate the menu or select anything on the pop-up menu. So you were soft locked, not just out of the game, but out of the entire console. So I had to physically go hold down the power button. And when that failed, I had to unplug the console, which if anybody has a console or any electronic device, you'll know shutting it off while it's in operation by pulling the power cord instead of properly shutting it down is not good and can lead to data corruption and all sorts of other issues. The point is, this is not something you would hope to see in a $500 brand new gaming device that you've been hyped up for and certainly that you've paired with an additional $60 game that just came out and is supposed to showcase what this thing can do. And there's a lot of other examples I could point to and as we go through the rest of the game here in this video we're gonna see a lot more glitches that will just pop up on screen. I won't call them all out because that's not what this video is. This isn't a breakdown of every glitch I came across in the game. This is supposed to be a critique of the game. So I've established there's glitches and problems, we'll move on. Anyway, enough of that, let's move on to discussions of the actual game itself beyond just the glitches and bugs. But first, before we get into all of that, a quick thank you to the sponsor of this video, Vessi. Vessi makes high-end waterproof shoes that both feel great, look great, and are incredibly functional. Whether you're running, going about town, or just lounging around the house, they have fantastic options that fit every situation. They actually sent me a couple of pairs and they've become my new favorites that I wear everywhere. And as if it couldn't get any better, they are actually sustainably made with less material waste in the knitting process, less water waste in the cleanup process of the manufacturing, and there's no animal byproducts, meaning that they're produced completely vegan. Not joking, they've become my daily driver's shoe and I cannot recommend them enough. In fact, I'm wearing a pair as I record this voiceover right now. Check them out today at the link in the video description box below or in the pinned comment and make sure to use my promo code Luke Stevens at checkout to save 25 bucks off of each pair of Vessi shoes you order. Okay, with all that said, let's get into it. Now let me be clear, I am not a long-term fan of this franchise and these games. I didn't grow up with them, I have zero emotional attachment to them. I did play some of Ratchet & Clank 2016 on stream over on Twitch in preparation for the new game's launch, but that's about it. That being said, I was taken back just by how similar the 2016 game is to this 2021 game. like freakishly similar. I've been using the word freakish and freaking a lot in this video. Gosh darn heck, I'm using a lot of language. Granted, Rift Apart had a lot of new bells and whistles, especially graphically speaking, but at its core, it's the same basic formula at play. In fact, the gameplay is so similar across these two games, I think many people will have trouble distinguishing between levels and challenges. Even now, I find myself looking at my notes to make sure that when I refer to a sequence in Rift Apart, I'm not accidentally using an example from its predecessor. And this, I think, is both a point in its favor and a mark against it. It really just depends on your approach and perspective on these things. To longtime fans of the franchise, it's likely a huge boon in the game's favor. After all, if you love something, why wouldn't you want another 15 hours of the exact same thing? However, that's exactly why for many, including myself, it makes this game feel like Insomniac was simply going through the motions while developing it. There are very few new systems and ideas at play here, the most obvious of which is the Rift system. After all, it's in the freaking title. Okay, maybe I should stop saying freaking. I, I'm getting like kind of self-conscious about it now. I, it just like is what I, it's my, like the word I use. So I should use something else. Here, let's try this. There are very few new systems and ideas at play here. The most obvious is the Rift system. After all, it's in the blopping title. Is that better? And that's such a big part of the game, we're going to discuss it in its own section in just a bit. But at its core, Rift Apart follows the same basic recipe as the games before. You watch a cutscene setting up the area you're about to explore. You explore the level, inevitably finding enemies to fight using an assortment of weapons and abilities. You take them out, recover ammunition from 
from them to refill your reserves and collect bolts, all to purchase new weapons and abilities. You use resources that you've collected to level up your weapons, and lastly, you finish the narrative goal of the level, and the cycle repeats in a new location. Of course, there's some variation here. Sometimes you're going to go to an area just for a cutscene or just for combat, in the case of Xerxes, where you can engage in all sorts of challenges. But the point is that the loop is the same from scene to scene, chapter to chapter, game to game. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. After all, Uncharted has been retelling the same story across its four major entries, and that is the story of the 1999 Brendan Fraser masterpiece, The Mummy. A rough-and-tumble hero starts in a rough spot, but manages to use his charisma and streetwise know-how to chase down the treasure he's seeking with the help of his friends, eventually getting the girl and realizing that he doesn't actually need the treasure because the girl was the real treasure all along. But even though the Uncharted games share the same story, doesn't make them bad games or bad stories. They can still be fun, they're lighthearted, they're kitschy, and that's all right. The point is, I'm perfectly fine if you want to keep reusing things that have worked before. If you want to keep handing me Guinness beers, keep them coming. I don't care, been there, done that before, but you're serving me liquid perfection, so keep it coming. But if you dare to hand me a Corona time after time, I'm gonna get pissed off at you because you're serving me piss water, and no amount of repetition is gonna make that dirt sludge drinkable. Cue people getting offended in the comments because I insulted their favorite beer. Buckled up, guys. I'll stand by it. Day in, day out. Corona's disgusting. All of this to say, it's okay for Ratchet and Clank to repeat the same structure and gameplay in this title because it's not necessarily bad to keep using something that worked so well before. It may be uninspired, safe, or even boring, but it isn't a bad design choice because it's similar to what they did before. That being said, it's so similar to the last game that I think it severely detracts from what could have been an otherwise remarkable experience. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart is good, but it's not remarkably great. It's the same reason that I criticized Red Dead Redemption 2 at launch for playing it too safe. The original Red Dead Redemption was great, original, creatively magnificent. And Red Dead Redemption 2 was just Red Dead Redemption 1, but with Lenny. Not bad, but too safe to wow anyone, since we've all already played the last one. But that's where we're at with Rift Apart. It's the same game as 2016's Ratchet and Clank, and it's a good one, but it's a game we've seen before. I really think I would have enjoyed Rift Apart a lot more if I hadn't touched the 2016 game in preparation for this one's launch, which is not something you usually would expect out of a sequel. Usually it's like, the sequel improves on everything the last game did, and if you play the last one, you're going to appreciate the new one even more. You play the original Uncharted, and then you play Uncharted 2, you're gonna be in love with it, because you can see how far they came, how much they added and changed, and how much the franchise evolved. In the case of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, it just does the same stuff, but with faster load screens and ray tracing. That being said, let's look at some of the things that this game does do differently. After all, I could nitpick how multiple quest assignments, customization items, or even animation sets are directly copied from the previous game, but I think that would be overly tedious. Suffice it to say, this game's gameplay structure is very similar to its predecessors. It is a true sequel in that it follows directly in the footsteps of the last entry, but the big question is whether it follows too closely in the footsteps, failing to chart its own course. To begin, the most obvious obvious change is the introduction of a new protagonist, Rivet. She's a spunky, witty, and truly likable Lorax that stands on her own as a character. And that is saying something, considering she's joining a cast that's known for having two of the most likable protagonists in PlayStation's ecosystem. Furthermore, Kit is also a unique, multi-layered character that has a backstory that's compelling, that thrusts her into conflict with the main characters, and poses serious questions about one's responsibility for past actions, and how many of one's past actions should be forgiven in the face of their direct consequences. And this was setting Ratchet and Clank Rift apart up for something that could have been really, really special. Two protagonists, two different movesets, different specializations, different gameplay and combat abilities. Could have been so cool. 
It's not here. You see, Ratchet and Rivet don't have different movesets, weapons, or even dodge animations. It's all shared. Sure, it makes the game a lot easier to play, bouncing from character to character, from scene to scene, but it's just not very engaging. And it furthers the idea that each of the Rivet scenes are just reskins of Ratchet scenes. That kind of sucks. There were multiple times actually where I was playing a level kind of zoned out a little bit. I'll be real, it's late at night. And I had to wake up a second and realize I was playing as Rivet and not as Ratchet. Because from the back, there are, of course, visual differences in color and everything like that. But in terms of actual movement and how you play the level, engaging in combat, using different abilities, it's all the same. There are fun narrative differences, and the parts with Kit are certainly very cute and fun. But in terms of gameplay, there's nothing that makes each character stand out as their own unique character. And so since everything is being shared, you would hope that what is being shared and distributed evenly across everybody is robust enough that you can formulate a solid gameplay experience from it. And thankfully, the weapon variety, combat, all does a pretty good job. You see, the weapon variety is certainly here, and they force the player to use many different tools to conquer the incessant waves of enemies that you will inevitably face. Ammunition scarcity is the main tool the developers use to force players into positions where they have to switch off of their favorite weapons, and it works great. Really, I don't think I can express enough just how fluidly this works. In the course of a single battle, you will swap through, in many cases, every weapon that you have unlocked to that point, draining them completely before switching to the next one. This is the same strategy that Naughty Dog uses in the Uncharted games to force you into using different weapons, except that here it results in a more fun experience and not a less fun one. And I think this is most due to the fact that this fundamentally feels like the player's choice, even though, to be completely frank, it's not. You see, the game is able to dynamically generate ammunition for certain weapons at certain times. If you run out of ammunition for one weapon, you'll notice that usually ammunition drops for another. This forces the player into a position where they can choose which weapon they want to swap to until they find ammunition for their original weapon. It's the same thing that Uncharted 3 did, allowing you to run out of ammunition for your shotgun in in order to force you into using a pistol. Except here, you have the full unrestricted choice of which weapon to swap to. And the choice of which weapon to swap to isn't actually a small choice either, considering that you are usually swapping to one of a half dozen other weapons that all have ammunition but different applications in which they operate optimally. Again, it's the illusion of choice, but it works in a way that leaves the player feeling more satisfied and as though they had a bigger role in what just happened than they actually did. Did. Not to dwell on it too long, but I really think that this method that Ratchet and Clank employs could have solved all of those issues in Uncharted 3, 4, and Lost Legacy, where it feels like the second you get a weapon that you enjoy using, the game rips it away from you because you run out of ammo. It could have been solved if they had just let Chloe or Nate hold on to their favorite weapons within a weapon wheel, finding ammunition to refill their stocks by exploring would have been much better, you know? It's almost like the exact thing that The Last of Us Part Two did. It's almost like they learned. Huh. Regardless, the gunplay and weapon variety is really good here. And each weapon manages to feel unique, punchy, and worthwhile. In addition, thanks to the PS5's unique offerings, specifically the SSD and adaptive triggers, there are things that Rift Apart is able to do that we've never seen before in any game, much less a Ratchet and Clank game. Firstly, let's look at the Rift system. This uses the built-in SSD on the PS5 to allow you to load between levels and areas quicker than anything to be perfectly honest, gamers have probably ever seen before. It's hard to put it succinctly, but it's just impressive. It's almost amazing, even, when you really think about what's happening and how impossible this would have been just a few short years ago. This is what I mean when I say that Rift Apart is truly a next-generational experience. This is a game that could not run on the base PS4 or even the PS4 Pro. This is a game that only would work on the PlayStation 5, and that's what makes it next-generational. That it's purely next gen and you can't do this frankenstein thing to make it work on the last one it's simply too much 
for those systems to handle. Beyond this, they also use this rift system to allow enemies to transport with the player across multiple rifts and areas, and it's employed in several major boss fights that allow for some pretty cool visual elements. My favorite example of this would be with the Emperor Nefarious boss fight at the end of the game on these platforms. Even though he's way off in the distance, he's able to punch you and fight using these rifts cutting much closer to you. I, I don't know. This is just really cool to me. This is something I feel like you would see in a movie. It's just really cool. This system is also used many times throughout the course of the game to allow for level variation across different maps. What I mean is that you can use these dimension crystals to change the environment around you into an alternate dimensions version of that level. And the gameplay designers use this masterfully to allow the player to go through the same level multiple times, or even to allow you to change the level multiple times throughout the course of going through it the first time to solve certain puzzles or to get past certain obstacles that you wouldn't be able to if you were stuck in one version of said level. It's done really well. And to be honest, this is exactly what I was hoping to see in Rift Apart, that they weren't just gonna use it to quickly load between levels, but that they would actually use it within the levels to allow you to do some different things that you wouldn't really expect to do. It's also used with your Rift Tether. You can basically warp from platform to platform, pulling yourself through rifts. It's just a cool way of navigating the map. Yes, just a straightforward jump or tether would achieve the exact same thing, but this looks a lot cooler. And every time it happens, it's just reaffirming the idea that these rifts allow you to travel through space and time dimensions. It's just, it's very well done. Bravo. Now, secondly, the adaptive triggers aren't just a gimmick here, as I think many of us were worried they would be going into the game. You see, in the case of a game like Spider-Man Miles Morales, there was adaptive trigger support, but the extent of it was that when you pull down on the trigger, once you reached about probably two thirds of the way down, you would experience resistance and that's it. That was the extent of it. It wasn't that you needed to really hold it down. And as you reach the bottom of your swing, it became harder to hold because the strain on the web was growing stronger, which is what I was hoping it would be. No, it was just a little bit of a cushion at the end of the press. It was incredibly underwhelming, but it allowed them to say that it had adaptive trigger support. I was worried it was going to be the same thing in Rift Apart, but no, it's actually pretty robust and affects the gameplay. You see, different distance trigger pulls allows for different fire modes depending on the weapons that you're using. For example, you might pull the trigger down halfway, at which point you'll encounter resistance, and while you're doing that, the gun is firing single shots in a semi-automatic fashion, just ping, ping, ping. But then if you push it the rest of the way, bypassing that resistance, you'll hear it and, and feel a snap, you'll go all the way down, and then it goes into fully automatic mode. That's what we're talking about when we discuss adaptive trigger support, using the triggers to engage with the game in a way that you couldn't have done before. Again, this is not something that you could have done on last generation consoles, simply by way of the controller, much less everything that's in the console itself. This is what makes it a true next generation game. The fact that it uses everything that separates the PS5 from the last generation in order to affect gameplay and how you go through levels. It's really well done, and this is probably my favorite implementation of the adaptive triggers. Close up there would also be Returnal, but they both do similar things with them. Point is, it's done very, very well. Furthermore, the tactile feedback in the controller makes the guns feel really good and solid as well. And with the improved haptic feedback within the body of the controller, you also have an increased awareness of enemies around you, their placement in the arena and the immersion that you feel. Maybe I'm a schizophrenic or something, but when I was playing with this thing, if I was shot from behind, I felt vibrations lower in the remote closer to you, which triggered you to look behind you knowing that the damage was coming from there in addition to the visual representation on screen. If you were shot on the right side, the right side of the controller would vibrate slightly more than the left side, etc. So really well done, and it's those small hints that add to immersion. I love it. 
Now, in addition to the immersion that you can feel thanks to the inputs and the controller, there's also a lot of really cool moments in here that stand out as unnecessary, but still great. In other words, they didn't have to put these things in the game, but their presence significantly improves the game and its offerings. Here are some examples of what I mean. When I was playing through the pirate level, I came across these robots, which were obviously paying tribute to Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean with the dog and the key. But beyond doing this, they also added in some unique dialogue that I really liked. For instance, here she's offering the dog head scratches, not scratches, because he's made of metal. So of course he wouldn't want scratches all over his head. He wants scratches instead. I, I don't know why that stood out to me as just a really nice, cute touch, but I thought it was adorable. So like, again, attention to detail. They didn't need to put that in there. They could have had just some robots playing with a robot dog and a key we would have gotten the reference and moved on. But instead they add this dialogue and they take it up just a little bit more by thinking through the dialogue and altering it from there. It's, it's just really well done. Or in addition, at the very end of the game, Emperor Nefarious sings a song called Everything You're Not, which for some reason reminds me of A Corpse Bride. I don't know, it just has that pace and rhythm to it. It's fantastic, I love it. La, la. If I ever lost, I think I'd just drop. My never-ending story of success is a lonely refrain. So I've one request. Join me at the top. Why don't you join me where the stars all shine? And join me at the top. Why won't you join me? Let our powers combine. You know I can't resist a ditty. So join me. Oh, wait, well, what a pity. Looks like I've all got. They can't come up. I'm everything you're not. Nope. Ha! Ah, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. I said that's pretty good. Oh, it's wonderful. Look at me and my flawless schemes. The kind you could never dream up in your dreamiest of dreams. Aren't you so lucky to have me to revere your flawless yet lawless emperor right here? Join me at the top. Why don't you join me where the stars all shine and I will never flop. No, I won't. Just join me. Go on, fall in line. And no one's given me good reason to stop my usual power season. Join me at this spot. I forgot I'm everything you're not. Who am I? Our greatness. And who are you? Wait, wait, I'm not going to say this. You're no good without me. What? How dare you ever doubt me? What? Now listen as the doctor sings the case. They join you at the top. Yes, they would. They join you where the stars all shine. And boy, I'm so freaking hot. You're scalding. I should have them up. But you will not. It's all kinds of rad. And hilarious. To be all big and bad. And nefarious. To join me on my plot. Never mind, forgot. I'm everything you're not. Nefarious on top. Although I've got to do it, I have to point it out. That's why you watch these videos. There's a typo in the subtitles for that song. It's not a big deal, but it's supposed to be everything you're not. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. They use the wrong form of your. It's kind of a, a noob mistake. Maybe it's been patched out at this point. It's something super small and stupid, but still bugged me. <laughs> All of this to say, I love these types of things in games because it shows the passion and the care that the developers put into the game. It's great, and I want to make sure to highlight and praise these things whenever I find them. Now lastly, we need to cover combat itself. As I said, weapon variety here is fantastic, and paired with the tactility of the controller, the adaptive triggers, and even the sound design of the effects coming out of the controller speaker, the overall experience of using weapons is satisfying and fits well within the rest of the game. But 
there's a lot of things to consider as well, such as enemy variety, difficulty of said enemies, level design, and movement requirements. For instance, movement. Most enemies require vertical or horizontal dodges for their attacks. This is because their attack patterns are usually lined up in one of these two ways, which makes them predictable and it feels fair, because as you grow accustomed to certain enemies, you'll learn how to dodge them. And having the basic system of vertical dodge or horizontal dodge, depending on the enemy, makes it a lot easier for your brain to figure out what it needs to do in order to avoid damage. Emperor Nefarious, however, at the very end of the game, is one of the very few enemies that does both in quick succession. And this makes him far more difficult and also more engaging, because he swaps between horizontal damage and vertical damage attacks frequently, instead of just relying on one for a set period of time before swapping to the other. And I really wish more enemies did this. I get it, the developers had a choice. They could have made a few really engaging enemies that have complex move sets that are really tough to learn and are engaging and complicated, or they could go with some more simplistic enemy types and throw a ton of them at you, copy and paste it across the level where you are running around and exploring. I get that they made the latter choice. I understand why they made the latter choice. I'm sure if they had chosen the former, I would be complaining that they didn't go with the latter. So I think it's workable. I just wish that there were at least a couple enemies beyond just the final boss that mixed it up a little bit more and made combat a little more than just a mindless engagement. Now, level design usually complements this basic combat dodging setup. There's often light cover for you to jump behind or around to dodge projectiles, but nothing ever comes close to the point where I'd say that the levels have true verticality, except for perhaps in the flying sections, but those don't really count since you're not navigating them with the normal move set. You're literally just flying through them. And one of the other things that this game's combat system has that takes it above and beyond what the previous entry was able to do is just the sheer number of things that they can cram into these levels. Really, when paired with the Rift system, there's so much phenomenal set dressing and frosting on the cakes here. This really is the secret advantage of the PlayStation 5's SSD, I'm convinced. The sheer amount of stuff that you can cram into levels now is so much higher, and I'm excited to see how other devs take advantage of it. Here, it takes the form of much more interactive elements and items, such as crates that can be destroyed, way more NPCs, and larger backgrounds that have have a lot more going on in them than we would see in games from last generation. Now, as for the enemies that you fight in these levels and their variability, it's not great, unfortunately. You see, there's a few base enemies that you'll fight throughout the course of the game, with a few basic reskins that make appearances later. Don't get me wrong, I think it's probably an improvement over the last title, but not by much at all. And the main way that this is hand-waved away as an issue is that, well, you're fighting a lot of robots, which of course follow a mold and are identical to each other. And also, you're sent back to the same locations repeatedly over the course of the campaign, and many more times if you're trying to platinum the game and collect all of the golden bolts hidden throughout the levels. Because of this, the developers could get away with repeating a lot of the same enemies and even some of the same arenas time and time again over the course of the campaign. In fact, most of the bosses are also recycled, and even the final series of combat encounters leading into the final confrontation with Dr. Nefarious and Emperor Nefarious, they're all copy and pasted from earlier levels. And there are three ways to look at this. One, it's a lazy reuse of content that pads gameplay time. Or two, it's a cool way to present the player with an opportunity to take down an enemy that they struggled with earlier. But now with ease, thanks to their newfound skill and improved loadouts, allowing the player to feel a sense of growth and improvement. Or the third option, which is that it's both. And I'm a proponent of this last theory. I think the copy and pasted enemies are merely a means of padding gameplay time that also just so happens to give the player the chance to kick the ass of an enemy that they may have struggled with earlier. I don't buy the excuse that it's part of some grand scheme to help the player overcome their insecurities within gameplay 
gameplay, I just think it's lazy. But it may also have that effect. The fact is that there's a lot of things in Rift Apart that suggest it was either rushed or that it's unfinished. The plethora of glitches and technical issues, in addition to the repeated content, lack of unique gameplay systems for Rivet, and the repeated return and reuse of levels, all support the idea that the game's scope was severely limited in order to get it out within a reasonable amount of time so that they could guarantee that they would have a another major AAA release put out for the PlayStation 5 before the PlayStation 5's first anniversary. Or the other option could be that it's not actually that the scope was limited, but that this is just how these games are. That they tend to have limited scope, repeat enemies, and different arenas multiple times, and that's just the way it is. It's simply a side effect of this franchise's formulaic approach and the gameplay loop which is repeated in this game mirroring the last release. But to wrap up the discussion of combat, in essence, it's good, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. I think that the weapon variety is the saving grace here, and it's truly impressive how well it all works, and the fact that the game isn't overly long also helps keep the gameplay feeling refreshing and engaging. I would have liked to see some improved variety when it came to the enemies, but beggars can't be choosers. Now another way that the game tries to keep things engaging is by way of its leveling system. It's the same skill tree, vine, bush, thing that we had in the last game too, and it's specific to each weapon. It's really simple. You collect what are effectively skill points and use them to unlock cells in this grid. The next cell you unlock has to be adjacent to a previously unlocked one, and once you unlock all of the cells surrounding specialty cells, you unlock that specialty cells perk. It's kind of interesting at first, but it really isn't as cool or unique as it seems. It's effectively a perk that's added to your weapon loadout once you hit a certain number of cells redeemed. Because after all, most people will select cells around these specialty cells first. It's just another way of using this sleight of hand to trick the player into thinking that they have more agency in the game systems than they really do. It's not even a bad thing. This is a pretty well executed example of this sleight of hand. I just do this for a living and I'm able to spot these kind of sleights of hand that the developers do all the time pretty easily. To be fair, it's a completely useless skill outside of making these videos, but you know, I'm a YouTuber, so most of our skills are kind of useless in the real world. Anyway, and lastly, there are some small mini games that they have here to shake up the monotony of shooting galleries and platforming, specifically the clank puzzles and the glitch virus puzzles. None of these really stand out as great, but they serve their purpose. Never really challenging, but sometimes they do have a few solutions that can lead to some interesting and creative outcomes. And with regards to these glitch virus puzzles, they're very straightforward and quick. You basically shoot through a bunch of small little enemies to go and blow up these stations that are throughout the level it's very straightforward never felt challenging and, and to me the only thing that makes these levels stand out at all is the fact that they flip the levels on their heads a lot of the time literally speaking they take the same level you were doing flip it upside down because you are free from gravitational constraints and you can climb on the ceiling and there's multiple times where you'll forget which way is up and which way is down where you started and where you're going because the levels become so confusing but it's not a bad confusing it's a good confusing it's kind of hard to explain, but if you ever get the chance to play this game and go through these levels yourselves, you'll probably know what I mean. All told, this game has a lot of things going for it. In many ways, it's fantastic. In other ways, it feels uninspired, rushed, and incomplete. There's certainly passion here, and there's a lot of love in here too. You can see it in a lot of those small touches that we discussed, but that doesn't excuse the shortcomings. And that's the point of these critiques, to call out these games' issues so that future releases can be improved. Rift Apart is fine, but it's not the AAA, fantastic, must-play, PS5-defining experience that Sony was hoping for. Unfortunately, we're still waiting for that game, whatever it may be and whenever it may come. I mean, we know what it is. It's abandoned. We'll just have to wait for when they release it. <laughs> but that's all for me. Thank you for watching. I love you all more than you could possibly know. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.